Hi guys, and welcome back. Now that you've got an understanding of what a terminal-based user interface looks like, let's start with the very foundational elements of building a terminal user interface yourself. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is the PowerShell host interface, which is actually exposed through an automatic variable called $host. So let's jump in and take a look at how this host variable actually works. All right, so here we are over in the 03 directory, examine the PowerShell host interface. And again, if you'd like to follow along with the notes or if you want to get a copy of any of the code that's written here, then go ahead and head out to github.com slash cbttrevor and head over to the PowerShell-terminal repository there. You can either just view it online or you can clone it locally on your system so that you can follow along. So the key learning objectives here are that the PowerShell engine can actually be hosted in different processes. And what I wanted to point out around that is that, you know, you've got the PowerShell extension running inside of Visual Studio Code here. And if you haven't uh, set this up yet, then you can go ahead and watch my other CBT Nuggets video skill on setting up Visual Studio Code for PowerShell. But I'm actually running this thing called the PowerShell Integrated Console here, which is exposed through the PowerShell extension for VS Code. And if I inspect this dollar $host variable, this is an automatic variable in PowerShell, which basically means that it's just automatically available inside of the PowerShell environment. You don't actually have to do anything to get it. It's just always there inside of PowerShell. And so that should be kind of a hint to you that if you're writing your own PowerShell application, you probably shouldn't use the dollar $host variable to store your own data in a variable. So what you can see on the host variable here is that we have some useful information about our host environment. So in this particular case, Visual Studio Code is actually the host, or rather the PowerShell extension for VS Code, is actually the host to this particular PowerShell process. Now, you can also see that we've got a version here. So this is basically just the extension version for the VS Code PowerShell module. However, if I was to switch over to like the Microsoft Windows Terminal here, for example, and look at the dollar $host variable here, you can see that I actually have the console host instead. So PowerShell, in this case, is being hosted by a console process rather than by the Visual Studio Code PowerShell extension instead. And even further, if I was to fire up the old PowerShell ISC here, which is uh, still valid, but kind of a defunct tool, it's certainly not as powerful as VS Code. Again, check out my skill on VS Code PowerShell over here at CBT Nuggets if you want some more information about why you should be using VS Code instead of ISC. But just for the old namesake here, we've got the host variable reporting back to us that Windows PowerShell ISE host is the host process of the PowerShell engine. And you can actually see we're running a different version of PowerShell here. We're actually running PowerShell 5.1, which is the desktop edition of PowerShell, instead of the cross-platform version of PowerShell version 7.1.0 that is open source over here. Now, when you print out the host variable, you're only going to see a few properties off of it. We've got the name, the version, um, we've got this instance ID, which is basically just a unique identifier for this particular session that would uniquely identify it from other sessions. So as you can see, all of my different, as you can see, all of my different sessions here have a different instance ID for them. However, what you don't see shown here is some of the methods and other properties that are available on it. So what you can do is use the PowerShell introspection command called getMember. And what this will actually do is give you a lot more information about the methods or you know, activities that you can perform on a particular object. Now, there's a specific child object of host that I wanted to draw your attention to. So if you take a look at host, you'll see that there's this thing called host.ui. So UI is a property on the host variable. And if we were to retrieve that property by just doing host.ui, you can see that we get back this object, which is an internal host user interface. And this is part of the PowerShell SDK. And we know that because it's part of the system.management.automation.net namespace. So pretty much anything that sits under that namespace is typically part of the PowerShell SDK. So what we're doing is basically accessing some of the internal plumbing behind PowerShell. And this is what we're going to ultimately use to write a terminal-based user interface. Now, the host.ui variable itself is only spitting back a couple of properties. It has raw UI and it has supports a virtual terminal, which is true. If I move out of the way there just a little bit, you'll see that says true. And so basically, what we're going to do is drill into this raw UI because supports virtual terminal, that's just a Boolean value. That's basically just telling us, does is VT supported? And it's basically set to true in this case. But what I'm really interested in here 
is the raw UI. So if I drill into raw UI, now you start to see a little bit more granular information about my terminal environment. For example, you can see the foreground and background. There's also some very useful properties like the buffer size here. So the buffer size is basically our screen size here from the top left corner at coordinate 00, zero down to the bottom right coordinate, which in this case is 134 characters across horizontally, and vertically we've got 28 characters tall. So those dimensions of the buffer are going to be incredibly important as we start writing custom data to different parts of the console interface. Now there's another property that I wanted to call your attention to down here as well called key available. And so you can see that key available is basically just a Boolean value indicating if there is keyboard input available for us to capture. And so every time that you run host.raw, sorry, host.ui.rawui, it is going to say that there is a key available. But if I was to actually put this in an infinite loop where I'm actually just checking constantly to see if there's a key available, eventually that buffer will dry up and it will change to false, at which point we can kind of pause our script and wait for user input. So we're going to be talking about that in a future video here. Now, if I take this host.ui.rawui and pipe it into get member, what you'll notice is that there are actually some methods that are not displayed because we're only printing out properties here. We're not printing out methods, but there are actually some useful methods on the host.ui.rawui class. Now, later on, when we start getting into the keyboard navigation type of stuff, we're going to be taking a look at the read key method. Also, you can do something called create a buffer and set buffer contents. So there's set buffer contents here. And then what we can do is actually create a buffer by using new buffer cell array. So what we can do is essentially think about uh, like a game, for example, where every you know, few milliseconds or so, you're basically generating a new frame and then drawing that frame to the screen. Well, a buffer cell array is very similar to that, where you're basically creating a new frame in memory. So that would be your buffer cell array. And then what you're going to ultimately do is to take that buffer and actually draw it to the screen and that's what set buffer contents does. So you can actually draw on a virtual buffer before you display it to the screen. Now that's a little bit more of an advanced topic that we're not going to step through in too much depth, but I did just want you to be aware that that capability does exist here. If you are interested in how that works, then go ahead and just open up this 01 host file here. And if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see that I do actually have an example here of how you can retrieve the current buffer contents you can create a new cell array, and then you can actually apply the cell array to the actual current buffer. One other thing that I wanted to point out to you as well while we're looking at the host.ui.rawui interface is the cursor position here. Now we're going to be making extensive use of the cursor position because that's how we actually move the cursor around on the screen so that we can write different characters onto our screen instead of using the buffer cell array approach. Now what you'll notice about the cursor position property on host.ui.rawui is that it actually has both the ability to get and set it. So basically not only can we retrieve the current position of the cursor, however we can also update the position of the cursor by setting its value to an instance of the coordinates class in the system.management.automation.host namespace. So what I could do here in my terminal is to, in square brackets here, search for coordinates, and that'll just auto-complete with the tab key for me. And if I construct, if I look at the constructor for this particular class, you'll see that it accepts an int x and int y. So up at the top left of our screen here, that's going to be x0, y0. If I was to go over one character, that would be x1, y0, and so on and so forth. If you want to go in the vertical axis, if I wanted to go one character down, that would be x0, y1. So keep those coordinates in mind as we are building out a terminal-based user interface. So now that we've had a chance to review the basics of the host raw UI interface, let's go ahead and jump into talking about ANSI escape codes and how you can colorize text output directly inside of PowerShell. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.